I'm Bob Rubin, and on behalf of the, all my colleagues at the Hamilton Project, we welcome you today's discussion on divergence in American life expectancy. The framing paper, which is in your materials, discusses divergence, discusses changes in life expectancy and mortality rates across geographies and across demographic groupings. And its basic point is that th these changes with respect to both uh, divergence and life expectancy, mortality rates, all of this is a function, obviously, of other factors in our society, economic factors, healthcare factors, and the like. And it also is a prism to wish to look at policies in these areas. As you can see from looking at the program, we're going to have the opportunity to hear from truly outstanding people, economists, healthcare experts in this area. So I'm not going to comment on the program itself, other than to say that the issues that are raised and we'll be discussing today are of enormous importance to our country, to our society, and to all of us. They are also issues that the Hamilton Project has focused on since its inception 10 years ago. Having said that, let me make three prefatory comments. Number one, this program epitomizes and embodies what the Hamilton Project was created to do. What we do is we bring together outstanding people, outstanding policy analysts and practitioners from around the country, and our objective is to further policy analysis, the development of policy proposals, and seriousness of purpose in policy dialogue. When we have commissioned papers, which we don't have in the instance of this program, they are rigorously peer-reviewed, just like they would be in any academic program. This mission, this mission of promoting seriousness of purpose in the policy arena, in my view at least, has become ever more important as what passes for policy dialogue in both the public domain and in the political domain has become increasingly political and ideological. Secondly, we have had now, as all of us well know, for an extended period, a largely dysfunctional government that has failed to address the great predominance of our critical policy issues. And that, in my view, will continue until Congress reestablishes its willingness to govern. We're all obviously focused on the presidential election, and that's very important. But beyond that, I believe that the future of our country, the future of our economy, will depend on whether or not Congress reestablishes its, its commitment to governance, its willing to engage in principled compromise, and its seriousness of purpose about governing. Hopefully, the continued development of serious policy responses to our challenges by being apolitical and non-ideological can help catalyze that willingness to work across party, political, and policy divides, and in that way, help our nation move forward. I would also add that that imperative for our elected officials to focus on governance and on working together to move forward on the great policy issues that we face is especially dramatized by the subject of this afternoon's discussion, since increasing life expectancy and decreasing mortality rates are literally life and death matters for all Americans. Thirdly, as we focus on health policy, poverty alleviation, and the other issues relevant to today's, relevant to today's program, in my view, contextually, we should always keep in mind, though it's not very popular to focus on this, that our intermediate and longer-term fiscal trajectory is unsound and unsustainable. And that poses multiple serious risks for all of our people. And those risks are likely to increase, and the adverse effects of not meeting those challenges are likely to increase over time. We may be lucky, and changes in health care costs and other factors may improve, but certainly the converse is also possible. In addition, there is the potential for serious increases not recorded any place or not projected any place in fiscal costs due to climate change, both with respect to emergency measures and adaptation. Thus, as we focus on the immediate and pressing issues that we're involved with today, we should also consider how to deal with the costs that are involved and 
we should encourage the political will of our elected officials to face our longer-term fiscal trajectory before we are forced to do so by its consequences. With that, I'd like to recognize the extremely capable leadership of the Hamilton Project, Diane Schatzenbach, our director, Kristen McIntosh, our managing director, and Ryan Nunn, our policy director. They've put together today's terrific program. I'd also like to recognize the hard work and the enormous talent of the staff of the Hamilton Project, without which nothing that we do would get accomplished. Our program will begin, as you can see from looking at your materials, with framing remarks titled Emerging Trends in American Life Expectancy by Ann Case, the Alexander Stewart Professor of Economics and Public Policy, or Public Affairs rather, at Princeton University. Then we will have a roundtable titled Harnessing Public Policy to Increase Life Expectancy for All Americans. The roundtable will be moderated by Diane, Diane Schatzenbach, our director, and Diane in turn will introduce the participants in the roundtable. In accordance with the practices of the Hamilton Project, neither Di Diane nor I will recite from the participants' resumes, they're in your materials. But I will note, as you will see by looking at those resumes, that they are each extraordinarily distinguished in their respective fields, and we are honored to have all of them with us today. I'll make one exception to the practice about not mentioning resumes, and that is add our congratulations to those from the many others that he has undoubtedly received, to Angus Deaton for receiving the 2015 Nobel Prize in Economics, and we are deeply honored to have him with us. With that, I will turn the podium over to Ann Case. Thanks, Bob. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, I'm going to try to frame what's going to, to um, uh, unfold over the next um, couple of hours here. And this work is actually very closely tied to work that Angus and I have been doing on uh, d uh, changes in mortality rates in middle age in America. And um, let's see if I can do it this way. Yes. When I give this paper, our paper, I, I usually like to title it this. And when Angus gives this paper, he likes to title it that. <laughs> so, but um, but before we before I send you running from the room, um, I just want to before we get started, even there has been a remarkable long-term decline in mortality among middle-aged and older-aged um, adults in America, and that has been accompanied by increased health. So people have lived longer, healthier lives in the last century. Um, and those, uh, the gains that we've made are documented in series of CDC reports. That's all, that's all great. Um, and these, uh, these um, improvements actually play a really important role in discussions about policy reform in Medicare and in Social Security. But that's not what brings us here today. Because the truth is not all is well. I will start by talking about mortality rates and tie it into changes in life expectancy. But let me set the stage this way. What you're looking at here is um, all-cause mortality for people aged 45 to 54 in countries that sort of kind of look like the US. So France, Germany, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, Sweden. And this, is, this shows you from the late 1980s to the early 2010s what happened to mortality rate in middle age in these countries? In all cases, they're falling at about 2% a year. If you named me your favorite European country, I could pretty much guarantee you it would be falling at 2% a year. So then, with that as sort of backdrop, what does the US look like? Well, if you look at US white non-Hispanics, which is the thick red line, in the 1990s, mortality decline slowed and then actually at the end of the 90s turned positive. So we actually see mortality rates actually going the wrong way. Depending on how you cut the data, it's at best flat, and at worst it's actually been increasing. Now US Hispanics look, <coughs> undis look, um, look much like Europe, falling at 2% a year. Very hard to distinguish it from Brits. And for African Americans who started at a much higher mortality rate, their mortality has been falling at an even faster clip at 2.6% a year over this period of time. So something here is happening um, to white non-Hispanics. 
Now this, this paper that was published in the fall got quite a lot of attention, and the CDC recently wanted to see how it tied in with their measure of life expectancy that they use. And literally in June of this year, a couple of weeks ago, they released a report that looked at increases in life expectancy at birth by race and um, by ethnicity uh, between 2000 and 2014. Now for all Americans taken together, there was a two year increase in life expectancy over that 15 year period. Um, much higher for black non-Hispanics who gained 3.6 years in terms of life expectancy a quite robust 2.6 years for Hispanics who have the highest life expectancy of any of these groups, and a rather anemic 1.4 year increase for white non-Hispanics. Now, um, life expectancy is an index number. It's a weird animal, right? And you might ask yourself, well, what are these changes in life expectancy? Like more is better, so this is good, right? And it's true, it is good. But it's, it doesn't really tell us necessarily what we need to know. It doesn't tell us where the action is. So changes in infant and child mortality have a really big effect on this measure of life expectancy because if you make your way out of infancy or out of childhood, you contribute to all those other years of lives as you, as you move ahead. And changes in mortality in middle age carry very different weight in life expectancy than changes in mortality at old age. So it's, you, you really have to unpack this. And also life expectancy doesn't tell you the causes of death that are driving these results. So when the CDC decided it wanted to see how mortality rates increasing in middle age for whites affected life expectancy, so they're gonna focus on non-Hispanic whites in this data brief, they have to unpack it. And they're gonna unpack it first by causes of death, and they're going to unpack it by which age group is actually contributing what to the change in life expectancy. So looking first at causes of death, these are the top 10 causes of death um, in the US. Um, uh, what contributed to the increase in life expectancy of 1.4 years? Well, we've made real progress in heart disease and cancer and stroke. Those have all added years to life expectancy. But pushing against that, you know, two steps forward, one step back, pushing against that are hypertension, chronic liver disease, which is basically alcoholic liver disease and cirrhosis, Alzheimer's, suicide, and what they call unintentional injuries. Now, for those of you who aren't fluent in CDC speak, unintentional injuries is the bin into which they put drug overdoses. And this is mostly a drug overdose that's actually pushing down on life expectancy when looked at in terms of causes of death. And then if you wanna look at like what ages are doing better and which ages are we not really doing so well, um, if you rank them from those, the people who are doing the best to the people who are doing the worst, so it's not chronological in terms of age, it's chronological in terms of who's contributing, the elderly are doing very well, thank you very much, and the near elderly are actually doing well. Children are actually making progress, but the people who are not doing well are middle-aged people. Those are, for, for those people, actually, they're depressing the increase in life expectancy. So this work that Angus and I did, which really focused on alcohol, liver diseases, suicide, and drug overdose, and that focuses on middle-aged people, we actually were targeting um, the, the groups that, that are weighing down on life expectancy. Now, I just want to make one last thing on life expectancy here, which is that recently also the CDC announced that there was no improvement, no change at all in life expectancy in the U.S. between 2013 and 2014. But that kind of masks the fact that for black non-Hispanics that gained a tenth of a year, Hispanics gained two-tenths of a year, and for the first time in over 20 years, white non-Hispanics saw a decline in life expectancy. So this is big news. I mean, this is big enough to actually turn life expectancy negative for a large part of the population. Now, in the work that we did, we focused on people age 45 to 54 because it's going to a journal, it has to be precise, you wanna make sure everything is just precise and 
And so 45 to 54 was our target. But if you broaden that out a little bit, the upper left corner here shows you what happened to people aged 35 to 44 over this period relative to the comparison countries with US white, non-Hispanic still in red there. Um, for older middle age, 55 to 64, that's in the lower left panel there. And you can see that, that uh, mortality rates flatlined for people 35 to 44. And they have not kept pace either in the 55 to 64 range. So way back in 1990, the US looked like uh, the UK in terms of mortality rates. But the UK kept making progress, and we've just left the herd, right? So the first question you might want to know is, well, why is that the case? And indeed, much as I just foreshadowed here, in the past 15 years, the biggest increases in death rates were for <coughs> drug overdose, for suicide, and for alcoholic liver disease and cirrhosis. Um, I just want to point out transport. We spend a lot of money on transportation safety, and it's just not an issue relative to these things that are probably being underfunded at this point. Um, to, a little bit more on some of these. Uh, there's not time to talk about this in detail, but I can tell you what the facts are. The facts are among the elderly, suicide is falling. Among middle-aged people, suicide is rising. It's happening for both men and women. It looks quite a lot more dramatic for, for women, but that's because they kill themselves at much lower rates than men do. And it's happening in every US state. So this is not concentrated in one part of the country. This is throughout the country we're seeing this happen. And it's not happening in other rich countries. A little asterisk here, French men in middle age, it's going up, but take any other European country, take men, women, it's not happening um, elsewhere in the rich world. Um, this is my only nerdy slide, and I'll explain to you what you're looking at here about drug overdoses. Uh, it's a little hard to tell because of the shading on the board here. This is uh, death rates from drug overdoses from 1979 through the 80s, across these first two rows here, down all the way to 2013. And there are two lines on each one of these charts, which looks at the, on the y-axis there, that's going to be the death rate from drug overdose, uh, graphed against age at death. And what you see is uh, two lines, blue for men and red for women. And um, back in 1979, we had a drug problem in America. It was, it was young. It was male. It was urban. All right, if you move through the 80s across that first row and then through the 80s more in that second row there, you can see it moving toward middle age for men. And then it stubbornly remains middle aged for men. It doesn't exit stage right, so it's not like one birth court moving through. It just becomes a middle age problem for men. And in the early 1990s, just almost imperceptibly at first, you see the women's rates begin to rise. It was always a middle-aged problem for women. And the problem gets worse and worse and worse until you get down to 2013. Um, the CDC, just to give you a few statistics, reports that in 2008, there were almost 15,000 prescription painkiller deaths, which may not seem like that many, but when underneath every one of those deaths were 10 treatment admissions for abuse, 32 ER visits for misuse or abuse, 825 non-medical users, meaning in 2008 about 12 million people were using prescription painkillers for non-medical uses. Um, from 1999 to 2014, 165,000 people are estimated to have died of prescription um, painkiller opioid overdose, and more than 1,000 people a day present at the emergency departments in the U.S. Uh, for an opioid-related, prescription opioid-related um, incident. Um, I wanted, uh, when we started doing this work, we saw that suicides were rising. We also saw that drug, accidental drug overdoses were rising. And we wondered, like, maybe you can't tell the difference between them. So if by census region you look at suicides along the bottom, at the, at the x-axis, and drug overdoses on the y-axis, so in the northeast, midwest, south, and west, what you see is that they're rising in tandem. 
right? So look at the Midwest there, 99, 2000, 2001, all the way up to 2013. And that's happening everywhere in the country. And that's, we really got the idea that suicide, alcohol-related liver deaths, drug mortality, may be part of a, all be part, all be symptoms of a diff, deeper problem here. That we've sort of call in our house uh, deaths of despair, just to give it a shorthand. Um, and now this is where the real work starts. Now we really have to go back into the weeds and look at putting these pieces together by cause, race, age, sex, country, geographic region, education, socioeconomic status related. <coughs> Um, variables here. And I'll give you just a few facts since I know my time is short and I want to make sure that I stay on my timeline. Um, fact number one, it's happening for all of all five-year age groups from 30 to 34 year olds up to 50 to 54 year olds. This is the mortality rate you're looking at from drug overdose, suicide, and alcohol related liver deaths. And you can see that in all parts of middle age from the late 1990s to 2014, you see increases in deaths from these causes. Um, fact number two, that was white non-Hispanics. It's not happening in the African American community. We don't really understand this yet. We, there's a lot more we need to know, but uh, you can see among uh, black non-Hispanics in their 30s, these lines are flat. These are all done on the same scale as the one I, I just showed you for white non-Hispanics. For, for African-Americans in their 40s, these rates are actually falling. Uh, the only group is that in late, late middle age, you do see a rise. But that, does, that looks very different from this. Right? So if it was just strictly poverty, uh, we don't have an explanation that says why this should be happening for whites and not for blacks. Another fact, pushing back in time now, so what I had been showing you was from 2000 to 2014. If you go back further in time, you can see US Hispanics flat for uh, deaths of despair for people age 45 to 49, for African American, US non-Hispanic non blacks falling. This crisis began before the introduction of OxyContin, right? So this is not just an OxyContin um, phenomenon. So whatever it was, there was pressure moving in this direction, right? So that's uh, fact number two there. Fact number three, and we think this is incredibly important, this is a problem that has landed on the heads of people in the lower part of the education distribution. About, and for people 50 to 54, white non-Hispanics, about a third of people at, during this period of time had a high school degree or less. About a third of the people had some college, and a third of the people had a four-year college degree or better. We're looking at men and women separately. And what you see is that men and women uh, with a high school degree or less are the people who are being hammered here. Right? So suicide, drug overdose, alcohol, and um, actually the excess mortality coming from these deaths of despair is about even between men and women. If I didn't have the high school degree or less people here, I could make a big deal out of the four year or more of college. That This is actually increasing, but it's just the increase is very, very small relative to what's happening to people with a high school degree or less. So this is where, where we're going to drill down in our work. Another fact, the drug overdose problem is a U.S. phenomenon. Here's the U.S. white non-Hispanics, these 50 to 54-year-olds here. I've highlighted Canada, Sweden, the U.K., uh, Germany, and the rest of the other countries are down here at the bottom. Now, Canada has a drug problem. You can't really see it because the U.S. dwarfs it, but if I got the U.S. out of the picture, what you can see is that the, it, it has risen quite dramatically for Canada and for Sweden and for the UK. Canada in 2012 delisted OxyContin as a, as a drug that would be reimbursable, which sent Purdue Pharmaceuticals scrambling to reformulate it for the Canadian market. They're right there. They're ready to, I mean, so, and, but, and Canada does have a problem. It's just, it's not of the same order of magnitude as what's happening in the US. 
Um, I also want to mention this, which is that there is something else going on in the U.S. that's not going on elsewhere. This was also highlighted in the Crimmins and Preston National Academy report, which is the U.S. is pulled away from the herd in terms of heart disease in middle age. So you can see other countries continue to make uh, progress on heart disease mortality, and the U.S. has flatlined. This is 50 to 54-year-olds. This is 40 to 44-year-olds, 45 to 49-year-olds. The picture is very similar if you look at men and women separately, although women have actually uh, borne more of this uh, burden than men have. The Crimmins and Preston report makes a very strong case that that's because women started smoking later than men and stopped smoking later than men. So that that uh, mortality bulge caused by smoking is still making its way through the system. And um, that is going on here in the background. If we had continued to make progress on heart disease, it would have masked what's been happening in terms of these deaths of despair. But the fact that the heart disease mortality is more or less flatlined has caused the, the deaths of despair to actually be able to rear its head far enough for people to ask what the heck is going on here. Okay, uh, one slide on morbidity. I, this is all about people dying. This is body counts. That's easy. But underneath this, in this period of time as well, for white non-Hispanics in middle age, year on year, their self-reports of health are falling. Their level of pain is rising. They report more sciatica, more chronic joint pain. Um, and it's those people who report pain who also report more social isolation, that they have difficulties with their activities of daily living. Um, the NHANES allows us to look at their liver tests, and liver enzymes are off the, have, have gone up quite dramatically for white non-Hispanics in middle age, suggesting more liver damage. And in this series of questions that they're asked, there's a significant rise in the amount of uh, serious uh, psychological distress in this group. So we have deaths of despair. We've got reports of health that are tumbling. I mean, we really need to know what is going on here. Right? So the proximate cause, one of the proximate causes, a big one that's getting a lot of attention, is uh, deaths from prescription opioid pain relievers. And you can see the dramatic increase in this. Now, it's possible that's, that they did slow it down a little bit in 2012 and 13, but in 2014, it's right back on trend. Right? So this is going to be a very hard problem to do something about. One of the reasons it's hard to do something about this problem is that people can switch into the other form of heroin, the real heroin, right? So where, where I work, people call Oxycontin hillbilly heroin, right? It's basically heroin in pill form, and it's legal. When they can no longer get drugs, people turn to um, heroin, which is cheap, pure. You don't have to inject it. You can smoke it. You can snort it. Um, and a lot of people who might not want to put a needle on their arm might be willing to snort it or to smoke it. People will come to your house and deliver it for you. Uh, one of the reasons, perhaps, why the heroin epidemic has gotten to be quite as bad as it has in suburb suburbia and in rural areas is that the transportation system for delivery is also right there. People tell me that it's cheaper than what we would call pot. I guess we, now you call it weed but that it's cheaper to buy heroin than it is to buy weed. Um, it's still hard for me to say that. But, um, uh, also, big increases in, in uh, deaths from benzos. Now, benzos are anti-anxiety drugs, Halcyon, Xanax, Valium. By themselves, they probably wouldn't kill you. But if you mix it with enough alcohol or if you mix it with methadone, which people are taking now um, coming off of heroin, those can be fatal. And so, actually, the death rates from those have been rising quite dramatically as well. So the proximate causes are drugs and alcohol and the flatlining progress in heart disease, but underlying causes, and this is where the work has got to go, declining prosperity for working class Americans, fear of downward mobility, disappearance of good jobs for high school graduates, lack of an adequate safety net, lack of social connection, these are all hypotheses that we need to go out and actually see what the data will support and what they don't support. Why hasn't this happened in other rich countries? They've lost a lot of their manufacturing jobs. 
those jobs went to Cambodia and Vietnam. Why hasn't this happened there? We don't have an answer to that yet. Why haven't blacks and Hispanics faced whatever's landed on the heads of white non-Hispanics? We have ideas. We don't have answers yet to that either. But let me tell you a little bit about how we're planning to look for some of the answers, which is we've begun new work that actually looks at mortality by cause um, and economic conditions by small geographic area in the US. And these areas, we call these kumas for reasons I won't go into because we don't have time. They're, they're smaller than states, but they're generally bigger than counties. But they should be big enough to give us reliable evidence on what's going on here. And just to give you one uh, slide on this, if you look at the kumas, so that's like, think of it as a mega county, employment to population ratio uh, for people 25 to 64 in the kuma. And then you look at deaths of despair from drugs, alcohol, suicide for people aged 45 to 54, white non-Hispanics, you get a really strong negative relationship between employment population ratios and deaths. If you want to, if you want to use unemployment instead, the, uh, this is U3, ages 25 to 64 unemployment rate in the Kuma, you get a very strong positive relationship between unemployment and these deaths. Now this is just in the cross section. When we look in the time series, you can actually look, you can then control for the economists here, so two seconds if you don't worry. If you can control, you can run regressions with state fixed effects and year effects and state interacted with year effects. You can run these with Kuma fixed effects, meaning within a small area over time in this area, when the EPOP ratio was higher, the deaths of despair were lower. So this, is, this gives us kind of a framework within which to think about at least drilling into some of the possible explanations for what's going on and using really the kind of rich data that are available that thankfully get collected at the national level to try to um, um, uh, see what's consistent with the data, what isn't. And then we move abroad and we try to figure out why the uh, other countries that we think of as being in our comparison class, this hasn't happened there. So I just want to leave you with, with what is probably our favorite cartoon, which we've now become, um, you know, you feel like you get your 15 minutes of fame if you get a cartoon. So this was the, the one I'll leave you with, which is, <laughs> so that's what I bring. Thank you.